So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for our panelists. Um, uh, I'm so lucky to be able to just ask my colleagues and friends to, to spend their afternoon doing this. And they just say, OK, why not? Um, I'm the spine surgeon in the group, and uh, um, I think you all know me. But here are the people that I really want you guys to pay attention to. The first is Bob Vokey, anybody that plays golf. I think you all know who he is. He is a true master craftsman. And if you don't have a Vokey wedge or have never played with one, um, you need to work on your short game. He was elected to the Canadian Golf Hall of Fame in 2017. And he is, I'm sorry, Bob, uh, he's been around for a long time and he's still working. Uh, he's yeah. one of the VPs of <laughs> Wedge Club Development. Don't get mad at me, Bob, but it's true. You've been on this planet a lot longer and you have tons of wise experience that that's why you're here. We want to, we want to take advantage of all the things that um, you've done in your career. And um, let's face it, every time I play golf, my back is just wrecked for three days. How were you able to stay active in golf for so long? And turns out um, Bob about two years ago could not play golf because of his back. And he has a special experience where he's had back surgery um, I think a couple of months ago. So he also has this added experience with um, when do you kind of decide you want to have surgery and what it's like and what the rehab has been like and what his expectations are and, and what I'm like as a doctor, can't answer those questions, um, things like that. So we're really lucky to have him. And uh, um, he's, he was the inspiration. I just figured we have to have to do something with Bob Vokey. And then um, we have Reese Jensen. He's a doctor of physical therapy, a very, very smart guy that I've known for many years. So um, I guess I've been in practice for almost uh, 20 years, like 15, 16, 17 years ago when I was at the university. He sent me a patient and he said something like, can I watch you do her surgery? And I said, sure, why not? Thinking there's no way he's going to come because a lot of people say that they never show up, but he showed up and he watched me do the surgery and and I guess I pimped him a little bit and started asking him questions. But ever since then, um, we've had lots of mutual patients together. And he's a really neat guy because he not only is a doctor of physical therapy, I mean, that's like very high level um, anatomy knowledge. He's also an expert in martial arts. He's the owner and director of um, PR and physical therapy in Encinitas, one of my favorite places. And I have a lot of patients from North County, so he sees a lot of my patients, even though they have to drive all the way down to Alvarado to see me. But he takes great care of them, and uh, um, he's going to answer a lot of questions about physical therapy, martial arts, golf. He happens to be Bob Vokey's physical therapist. I probably just broke a bunch of HIPAA rules. But, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. But it's true. It yes. And he's a master magician. And he's a very good looking man, too. So uh, thank you, Reese, for joining us. And then we obviously went, you know, age before beauty. We have Kendra Ballone. Uh, she's a PG uh, golf professional. She um, has a career in marketing as the director at Ensign Services. Uh, she is a YouTube and radio personality. And uh, she's one of my favorite people. And she's been playing golf. It's true. Uh, you can thank you. That later, though. Um, she has a career. She's got two kids. She's got an Australian husband and you know what those guys are like. So she's busy. So how is it that she stays so fit and healthy? Um, she probably has a little bit of back problems too, but cause that's just inevitable. But how does she stay playing golf and what are some of the secrets of staying healthy so that you can play golf forever without ever having to see somebody like me or Reese Jensen. So, um, thank you for joining us, Kendra. And, uh, uh again, I want to remind everybody to open up your little chat box, make sure you're sending things to all the panelists as well as all the attendees and start typing in questions, comments, et cetera, um, and any insights, especially if you know any funny um, stories about any of the uh, panelists, except me. All right, so um, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because this is a significant problem. This is the nagging low back pain problem. It's not enough to you know, turn your life upside down and have some massive spine surgery, take um, three to six months off work and basically discombobulate your career if you're in the middle of you know, climbing up that career path 
or whatever it is that you're doing in life where you're trying to be the best that you can be, this is such a common problem, this kind of low back pain that is nagging, that still lets you work but not achieve your full potential, that is a big deal because life is short. And if you're anything like me, I started getting interested in golf, so what do I do? I'm just obsessed with trying to get that swing down and trying to get better and better and better. I don't want to be this, the guy that has this back pain medical problem that prevents me from you know, trying to beat the people that I'm playing with because that's just my personality. I can't help myself. And I know a lot of people like this, including myself, my brother, and every year I play golf with my college buddies that I've known since I was 18. I'm going to be 56 this Friday. And we're just dropping like flies. So it is a huge problem. And if you just look at it, like overall in the US, 75% of adults will have a back pain problem sometime in their life. Most of those people, that episode resolves in six weeks, but 7% become chronic. Just think about how many people that is. That's like millions and millions of people. There's 300 million people in the US. If half of them are men and half of those are working, I mean, do the math. It's incredible how many people have this problem. And if you just look at the cost to, to our health insurance, it is the second most common reason why patients go to their medical uh, doctor for office visit. And it's the number one cause of work and disability. So um, it's not just about me and my buddies. It's a societal thing. And it's a very common problem. Now, to my screen just got unshared. Thank you. I have no idea what I did, but that's why I have Lana in my ear. It's so cool. It's kind of freaking me out at first. I'm like, where did that sound come from? Is that sharing? Lana? Okay, so um, where was I? So to kind of put this into context as to why I think this is such a problem, um, this is where it starts. So where does this pain come from? I mean, that is an obvious question. Now, here's like in the medical literature, the causes of back pain broken up into a pie chart of what's the most common, right? Now, I have to point out that this is from the doctor's perspective. So when you go to the doctors and you see a back pain, they're thinking, okay, could it be cancer? Could it be a fracture? Could it be ankylosing spondylitis? Could it be spinal stenosis, discrimination, sciatica, radiculopathy? I bet you most of those terms, most of you don't really know what it's about, but that is like a little sliver of the total number. That big blue part of that pie chart is this, non-specific low back pain. So the vast majority of people, they go to the doctor's office, they go I have low back pain, and the doctor basically, not all doctors, probably me, and people like me, and I think there's a lot of people like me. We're just like, it's not cancer, it's not a fracture, it's not ankylosis spondylitis, it's not stenosis, blah, blah, blah. You're fine, go away. But for many people, that low back pain is enough to keep from, from achieving all that they can achieve. And again, I'm a big believer in quality of life. I'm a big believer in you know, having people, if they want, if that's their desire, to be able to reach their full potential without having a medical issue that is preventing them from achieving those goals. So if you look at all the reasons, if I had to boil it down, the two main causes of this kind of nonspecific low back pain is a problem with the disc and or a problem with the muscles, probably a combination thereof. Um, but the discs are shock absorbers and like all kind of shock absorbers and treads on a tire, it wears out over time and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And when you load tissues over and over again, it will wear out. There's a smaller component of people that have kind of weird like ligamentous disorders or bone problems. Uh, but the vast majority of the causes of low back pain are disc problems and or muscle problems and usually a combination thereof. So the next question that most people will ask is, OK, now that you've told us no one pays attention to this. There's got to be a treatment for this. And just to give you an idea of what like, I'm like, here's how I think about the treatment options. There's either non-operative treatment or operative treatment. Obviously, this is the surgeon's perspective. 
And I would say that for every one patient that I operate on, I see in the office 19 other patients that I treat non-operatively. So I'm basically a non-operative spine specialist, and every once in a while, I'll do surgery on somebody that basically has failed non-operative treatment and is a perfect candidate for a very reasonable surgery, right? So I don't want to have surgery. I want to know how I keep playing golf. Um, in fact, I want to know how I can keep playing golf without having like those two days of just walking around bent over in pain. Um, and so with that, let me end the slide presentation. And let's start out with some questions. So um, I already have a bunch of questions. So if the chat box, use your chat box and put your questions in. But I'd like to ask the following questions. Hold on, I have a list. <laughs> I just got to find it. Oh, there's some questions in the Q&A. OK. All right, let me read this one off. This is a hard one. I'm just going to read it. In 2015, Dr. Kim performed a two-level spinal fusion and internal fixation. I also have scoliosis. I keep active and walk every day. Ride my bike and swim each week. I want to begin golfing on an executive course in my neighborhood. Recently, I tried it out at the driving range last week. Obviously, I've lost some flexibility, but is it okay to golf having had the spinal fusion surgery? Okay, I'm going to click answer live. I think it's going to get transcribed. Let me start because I guess I operated on you. <laughs> and here's my philosophy on that. We did the surgery so you can reach your highest level of potential. That includes playing golf. The key is, is that you have to start real slow and gradually build yourself up so that you can prepare for kind of all the stresses that you're going to undertake. It'd be like if I wanted to run a marathon and I hate running, I would like plan it out like six months from now. And, and this weekend, I probably won like run one mile, then two miles and three miles. And I probably have some ups and downs and I'll take a few steps forward and a few steps back. That's what you have to do. And the second thing is, is that everyone's unique. And essentially, I've gotten to the point in the last 20 years of deciding um, maybe there's kind of a universal exercise regimen that everyone can do and you'll get most of the way there. But when it comes to the spine, I've realized that it's much better just to give in and say everyone's different and you need kind of customized care. If you really want to, you know, put the resources into getting better um, and you've already tried standard PT, you want to get like really high level customized PT so that somebody can watch you get built up and help you like a professional coach for any athlete would do. They would give you guidance throughout the whole thing. It'd be like Tiger Woods showing up to the master saying, I'm Tiger Woods, I don't need a coach. People would think they're crazy. So that's what I would recommend. And I would encourage you to get back to golf because golf is awesome. My mom had a two level fusion and you should look at the YouTube uh, video of her playing golf on the first time. She's like, I tell my mom, take a nice easy swing. She's just like me, <laughs> going for it. So the answer is a resounding yes. You just gotta start real slow. So- hey, Dr. Kim, can I, can I add to that too, as a quick question? Um, how do you feel about taking Advil or whatnot? Because I know a lot of times we would say, trust your body. If it's starting to hurt, you know, that's when you know you've kind of hit that limit. But when you're taking things like Advil, you can run right past that period of time where, you know, you should have stopped a while ago, but you can't feel it. So in that case, would you suggest maybe not taking those kind of anti-inflammatories or that medication that would prevent you from actually feeling when you should stop? Oh, that is such a good question, Kendra. Okay, so you can see why she's really smart, is a YouTube personality, and, uh, and does a lot of radio interviews. Okay, so that is a very good question. I would answer it like a politician. Number one, if you can avoid taking medicines like that right before playing golf, um, because you can get by without it, and it doesn't make that big of a difference, I would recommend that you don't. But I'm also a believer in life is short, so... If you take that medicine, it's not like a narcotic that will completely block your pain signals. It just blunts the inflammatory system. So the only risk that you probably can do is overdo it so that two days later, you're like, oops, I shouldn't have probably played those extra nine holes like I did the other day because <laughs> um, we got done early. 
So um, the answer is a definite maybe. Um, I'm always about optimizing and uh, performance. So if you do that and then two or three days later, you just hit a, a huge speed bump um, and have a bad flare up, that would be an indication that you're using it improperly. If, on the other hand, you maintain relatively high level of fitness, you don't have that big rebound two or three days after like being a weekend warrior, um, then, and it enhances your performance during the activity, then I encourage you to try it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. What, yes, it does. <laughs> what do you think, Reese? Are you worried about people taking kind of uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories uh, with the risk of them injuring themselves unknowingly? Yeah, I usually advise the same kind of thing is you have to understand how your body's doing with the activity. So if you don't take anything and you go out and play and you're like, you know, I'm really sore the next day, but it's not damaging you. It's not, you're not having leg pain or numbness or weakness or something like that. Um, and it's just soreness. First thing is, am I in shape to play golf? Because golf's a whole body activity. So if you're going to go out and like, like your question, um, somebody had scoliosis and had fusion, if you're going to go out and play golf, um, there's general fitness. Are you in like reasonably good fitness to start with? Are you doing golf specific exercises like, you know, working on torso rotation up here in a neutral position? Can you do that without any pain? And you want to do all that before you go out and start swinging the club and, and hitting a hundred balls at the range, because if you don't have the fitness, then you're going to be sore. And if you're sore and you go, oh, then I should take the Advil, then you're going to get into that pattern. And that's not really a good pattern. If you get in shape and you go out and say, you know, I played 18, it was a, it was a rough course, uh, I hit a lot of driver, and I know I'm going to be sore tomorrow, and it's just soreness, yeah, you go ahead and take it, and it gets you through so that you can go out and play again. Just, I don't, I don't like patients getting dependent on it. it like you yeah. said, not a narcotic. So I'm not going to keep you from doing something, you know, that's going to blow your back up, but it may allow you to, to work a lot harder than you're ready for, in, in which case you're going to be more sore, and eventually that's going to catch up with you. Bob, what have you done in the past? I mean, do you take an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory before you go out or you try to avoid things like that? You know, Doc, over the years, I found that they didn't help me at all. They just didn't do anything for me, you know? Now, I've even actually went so far as to try stronger stuff because that's how I resorted to, I was in so much pain and I wanted to play and they did not do anything at all i guess i guess back pain is a unique pain there's some oh. things that are there's not that many things um as painful as a really severe uh, episode of uh, back pain when you also have the muscle spasms deep inside these powerful muscles people can't even catch their breath sometimes and i've been there myself so um there's multiple different kinds of pain um you probably started out with kind of the muscle spasm, dysrelated pain, and then it slowly became, do you mind if I talk a little bit about your condition? Yeah, yeah, please. So um, uh, uh, there's multiple different kinds of medical uh, uh, spinal problems. Um, for most of us, it's like a disc problem with an annular tear and some early arthritis. You get a pain flare up and the muscle spasm uh, kicks in uh, and it can be very severe for like two to four weeks. But another group of patients will have um, a gradual worsening of their disc degeneration to the point where you start developing bone spurs. And now all the nerves that go down your spinal canal, they don't have enough room to breathe. They basically have a tourniquet around them. That's called spinal stenosis. And that is not a muscle problem. That is a problem where the, the nerves that need to generate electricity is not getting enough blood. So when you stand for a while, your legs get really achy or numb and tingly or wobbly or uh, and you can feel it deep inside your butt cheeks, too, and it's hard standing up straight. So um, that's a problem that when did that start for you, Bob, where you couldn't really stand up Actually, straight within your leg? The, the, real, the real bad part, I guess, I noticed it, which I would try to play with. You know, I play four or five holes, have to go and sit in a golf cart and things like that, you know, and it wasn't enjoyable. I couldn't beat enough balls so I could enjoy the game. That was the other thing. Every time I try to beat balls, it would hurt more, you know. So I wouldn't play, wouldn't be hit balls all week, and I'd go and try to play, and I'd be miserable out there. 
you know, not so much for the pain, but the visible that I can't hit a golf ball due to lack of practice. Right. So, but it happened in, I noticed in the fall of this year, I noticed, I remember hit a, hitting a tee ball. And I came back to my buddy in the golf cart. I said, you know, it feels like somebody just kicked me right in the butt on the left side. But then it started to gradually get worse. And then I did a little uh, wedge seminar down in Australia. And I guess the flying down there and flying back. And I noticed, I recognized it down there that it started to get, you know, I said, wait a sec, this is not much fun. My leg has gotten numb. I got to where I had what they call the drop my foot. My foot was just slamming. I couldn't hardly walk. And I said, okay, this is, this is not normal. That's when I started to panic. That's a nerve problem. That's when I said. Luckily, most people that have problems with golf and back problems, they don't have what you have. And let's just face it. I mean, Bob is so tough. I mean, if you looked at his spine, you just think, how can he, how could he even be golfing as of two years ago? But it's amazing what, um, what uh, staying healthy and fit can do to kind of offset the, the severity of these diseases. Okay, so this is a question that I had, um, and we should go around the table. What can you do right before you start a round to kind of help, um, A, having a great round in terms of being um, feeling strong and coordinated, and then um, avoiding that flare-up of back pain a few days afterwards. So let me start with um, Reese. What do you think is a good set of, like a regimen that somebody can do, um, like me, to avoid getting that flare up? You know, realistically, you, you want to allow 15 minutes or 20 minutes before you hit the first the first shot. Um, general warm up. And so my, my patients that belong to clubs, they can go in the gym, well, not in COVID, but they can go in the gym and ride the bike or walk on the treadmill or get their heart rate up a little bit. Um, and then stretching your low back, um, doing some rotational stretches with the club, making sure you have that range of motion, shoulders. Um, it's, it's about 15 minutes worth of stuff. And Kendra, and if you go watch a, a pro golfer warm up before a tournament, they're out there for at least an hour, at least an hour warming up, stretching, hitting different clubs, trying different things. The warm up for a pro golfer would wear me out. I mean, that would be my day right there. Okay, so, so it's not just going. It, look, it looks funny. Like you see him do some weird stuff too, but. All righty. So, like, what do you recommend? You know, a pro golfer sort of needs to do fall right off the first tee. Best, right? We we usually as a as an amateur we take three to four holes to get warmed up before we're actually playing our, our game, and that's because we don't take the time before we start playing. So, general warm up. And then, and then sports specific stretching, like you said, running is going to be a different set of stretches. Golf has more rotation and lumbar stretches and shoulder stuff that you should do because you can eat, injure your shoulder as easily as your knee at, or your back if you don't warm up before you start hitting the, the big dog. All right. If you have a video or a link to something that um, you can share through the chat feature, um, throw that in there. Otherwise, um, give it to Lana and we'll follow up with an email. Um, because I'm sure that there's kind of a, a starting point and then ultimately each person's going to have to customize it. So I'm dying to know what Kendra does, um, because I usually literally run up to my first T and I don't even warm up. I, I don't know what my problem is. They should just, just give me a little free bit way, of freeway to fairway. They call it. Yeah. You just go right <laughs> up to the T so, freeway um, to fairway. I need, I need like some marching orders on what to do. Well, it's hard because when you are golfing as a profession, you're out there, so you're spending the time. But when you're working, sometimes you are just coming right out of a meeting and you're late to your tea time already. Your people are standing up on the tee. So at that point, I mean, you need to, if that does happen, then let's be realistic, it's going to, right? You definitely want to be the last player in the group to hit, but you've got to be willing to do some stretches and some warm ups, And sometimes you'll see people even if you, you do make it to the range, you start with the small chip shots, right? You pull out your Vokey and you just kind of like make the little short shots because you've got to get some of that rotation. And I think people also discount the fact that their legs play a really big part in their back pain and you have to stretch your hamstrings. So if that's like trying to, you know, touch your toes or hopefully you're not in a really short skirt, but whatever, um, and just stretch out a little bit because those are the muscles that are really going to um, kind of pull on whatever is painful, you know? 
hey doc, you know what I've really tried? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Get there and have a couple of beers before I tee off. That helps numb the pain a little bit, or I don't care about it. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work. That's surprising. Yep, yep. It doesn't work. <laughs> I have tried it, trust me. <laughs> margaritas, those days, margaritas. <laughs> yes, oh yes. That's why golf is such a great game. I mean, you could like go crazy and like just focus on every single oh. little thing and get all intense, yep. or you could just have a couple of beers, hang out with your buddies, catch up, talk the whole four hours, and then come home and realize you don't know anything that's going on in their life, but what a great time. That's golf. <laughs> that's it. That's that is, that is yeah. golf. Yeah. Um, is I'm going to start exercising. And let's keep going down the questions. One of my surgery colleagues just asked the question. He said, "How? okay, it's a surgery question. I'm gonna ask that next, Dr. Fias. All right, here's one for Reese. Somebody says um, they see a lot of SI joint dysfunction. Do you see a lot of patients with SI joint problems as a cause of their nagging low back pain due to golf? Uh, yes, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. The SI joint is is an anchor on both sides of your pelvis, of your spine, and all that rotational activity can de definitely affect your SI joints uh, more in females than males because theirs move a little bit more, you know, especially postpartum. That's where I usually see the SI stuff, not so much in the older guys like us. Um, all right, but so it, it is a it is a go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, and then if you are have if you have an, an upslip or a rotation, then getting some manual treatment, whether it's PT or osteopathic or chiropractic, that can help align that. But then we go back to why did it happen? It happened because you had um, you didn't have enough stability. So dynamic lumbar stability exercises are what you should be doing to yep. make sure your lumbopelvic girdle is you know this whole thing is stable enough to allow that that violent rotation, right? If we could play nine holes right-handed and nine holes left-handed, then we wouldn't have this problem because we'd spread the forces out, but we can't. So every time we, we swing through as a right-handed golfer, you know, we're, we're banging those facet joints on the right side and, and putting a lot of torque on the SI joint. So if you don't have muscles to absorb that, then it's going to go to the ligaments and the discs. And that could be SI, it could be iliolumbar ligament. Um, so it, it's a symptom of not being strong enough and or playing too much or playing when you're tired. Which brings me to another question that I've been, that's been burning in my mind. Um, let's face it, golf is not like this natural sport. Like somebody had to like think really far out of the box to go, let's invent a sport that involves, I know, hitting a little ball with this long stick and this thing on the end. And that motion is so awkward. So the question is, um, is golf and the golf swing just inherently a bad sport for people with back pain? And she would just say, forget it, give up. I'm not meaning that, but that would be one extreme. And two, does your swing affect your, you know, your back pain potentially? And if so, should people go in and have their swings analyzed? Yeah, I mean, golf is a, is a unilateral activity. All right, let's let Kendra answer no, first. That's a good, go see, like go see Kendra. That's I it. got my hand up. She's like, oh, 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 I have such an answer for that. And I didn't, I did not <laughs> even talk to her about this question ahead of time. No, but I think so many people just think that they can, like they discount the fact of what a really good coach does, right? They think, oh, I'm just going to teach myself or those pros are just trying to get to the next level. But coaches are really good for a lot of reasons. First, they can identify little things in your body that even, even your back is supposed to be a straight line, but so often we kind of curve right over our butt. We just, it's natural for us to stand like that and point our stomach out. That right there causes a really big problem. And if you fix it, you hit the ball better too. So it, it's just something that a coach might be able to identify. Or, you know, if, if a coach has told you that, then you can put your camera on yourself and kind of look at it that way. Also, there is this thought, at least I grew up with it, where the longer the swing you took, like if your club was all the way to parallel or past parallel, that made you hit the ball further. And I think 
really in general, it's not about the length because sometimes we think about that and we think we got to push our arms just a little bit further to get there. And then your arms have totally disconnected from your body. And the goal is really like if I stand up here and back up a little bit, but the goal would be more to like have this triangle and keep it where your shoulders are the ones that are turning, but you can see my arms don't necessarily make it all the way back. That, that hurts. And if somebody's trying to hit the ball really far, they just think I'm going to take the biggest swing I can and rip it. Versus... He's not talking about me. I swear. I, I swear. <laughs> long, about that. I would never do such a thing. But really, oh. the goal is to just, you know, your shoulders. I just lost my earbud, earpod. Your shoulders are um, the key to where your swing should stop, not your arms continuing to go, because that's what hurts your back, right? So a coach would tell you that. I have to get my, my earbud. I better get some coaching. No, I've had a picture of you. in my entire life. It's really sad. I'm not a All right, Reese, what do you think about the golf swing? Well, I, I, uh, my disclaimer is I'm not a golf teaching professional. Bob, Bob will attest that I haven't told him how to swing the club. He knows how to swing the club. I'm teaching his body how to, how to move again. And we do have a, a golf swing emulator, which is a, a generic <laughs> swing playing activity. And he loves it. Um, just to get the muscles in the right sequence, doing the right thing. But when I see somebody in there and they're, I know that their swing is off. I know that they don't have the education. I always send them to a, a golf professional to get that education. And then they come back to me and we, we work that together so that I'm moving, getting their body to move properly with the, with the right foundation. And they're teaching them how to actually strike the ball. I don't know why I even had to ask that question. Cause now when you, the way you say it, I'm just thinking like, I could have had a V8, no duh, but sometimes it's just, I need to hear from people like you. So I know what Bob's going to say. <laughs> what do you think, Bob? How big is your, like, did you have to change your swing over your career to deal with back problems? Well, I had, I had to change it to deal with age because my body couldn't do the things that it used to do. I found out one thing years ago, you get at a certain time, you used to be able to swing, keep it down, stay in the inside and get good inside out swing. You get a little older, that move is very tough to make. It's almost like it's a natural over the top type swing. Cause I found you can, I've talked to people about that. Maybe Reese might can understand that or heard of that too. But somebody told me that. So I'm saying to myself, forget trying to get inside. Darn, I'm 80 years old, forget it. You know, I just, I'll swing the way I do best. And that's slightly, over the top and it's easier to swing that way and i don't hurt myself as much when i try to get inside did you figure that out yourself I, or did it did a coach watch you and figure it out i uh i got that from from dave phillips over at tpi titleist tpi center in oceanside mm -hmm. he mentioned that to me you know and i said you know what dave i've started to hit a fade when i never hit this many fades in the last you know 20 years and uh, that's when I said, okay, I'm not going to, every time I try to get inside, doggone if I wouldn't, <laughs> the next day, it, it'd be sore. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. Have you guys heard that before? Yeah. 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 You lose, you lose rotation ability in the spine and you lose rotator cuff um, flexibility. Uh, your hips also get stiffer. So you can't make the same turn and you can't come down at the same angle that you did when you were younger. And yep. And in fact, you, you, you go out in neutral. So instead of, instead of having that straight line down the back, now you're starting to do this kind of stuff. And that does lead to strain on the tissues. So adapting the swing, shortening your backswing, using the technology of you know, grips and different shafts to, to give you more, uh, let the club do more work, right? And then having your golf pro say, look, you know, the way you're hitting it, you're gonna have to move the ball up or back in your stance because that'll, that'll correct for your you know, the change in your swing, but the swing, it has to change. You, you cannot do the same rotation and no same, doubt. You know, but it comes with you, age. You know, I, I got a good, good buddy of mine, Lee, Lee Trevino, people might've heard of him. And I kept telling him, I'm not swinging like I used to Lee. I said, Volk, we're just both the same age. I had to change my swing a little bit too, as you age, and your body, your body cannot do it anymore. You can't, you lose that whatever, a twist, a flexibility. I wish that club at speed. Yeah, that's all. like, just film you and just give you a little bit of advice. Like with your age and that swing plane, maybe you should just kind of let it go a little bit more opt-in or something. 
All right. Let's keep there's going. Also, there's also a, a period of like <laughs> where you can get equipment that will help you with that too, right? I mean, in your mind, it's always like a no, I've always hit steel shafts. Well, you know, maybe they make some really good graphite shafts now that are lighter, you know? No oh, doubt about and then one of our, uh, one of my patients, also a Titleist engineer, he said something that kind of blew me out of the water. He said, okay, all this technology and all this, that's really important, but the single most important thing besides having a good swing is getting your clubs fitted for you and your swing. I've ne I, I'm like, oh, I've, I've never even bought clubs. I'm All my clubs are hand-me-downs. So I'm thinking, I hope, I have no idea if they fit me. Is that really true? <laughs> you know what, you know. Uh, you know work, for surgery, I, I, all my instruments are customized. Every single one. It's hilarious. So I don't all, know. All, of, all the seminars I go at, Doc, I get, go to a lot of them. And everybody asks me, and I'll get it, what's the most important thing that you can tell to the player to help their wedge game, their short game? And I always tell them, go get fit. Most important thing. Right. First off, go get fit. Okay, this is the Titleist VP of product development. So with. what do you think, Kendra? Is that That's, really true? That means go to a Titleist fitting center. Right. <laughs> yeah. I want to say the clubs at a tournament, and I had them fit. It was a different company, but I know this is a Titleist-sponsored thing. So um, <laughs> but having a I'll tell you how Titleist sponsored me. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> Having a kid no. for me uh, made all the difference. I mean, uh, my really my swing got a lot better. better. Okay, mm -hmm. I I first need to get my swing, but then I'm gonna basically do that. I told myself. Well, that's that's the tough part because I get asked a lot about, you know, hey, I want to buy my wife clubs. Should I get her custom fit? And I'm like, has she ever swung before in her life? And I start with a start with like a just a general set, make sure she likes it, and then right. go into it. But there's also that fine line of I'm taking lessons now. I don't want to get fit yet because they're going to change my swing and then the lie and all of that is going to change. So, I mean, you do have to consider it, but for the people that are watching this, they're golfers. So I think it's safe to say you, you should be fit. By now. Say, I'm, I'm not good enough to be fit. I get that too. People tell me I'm not good enough to be fit. Mr. Volke. I say, yes, you are. That's It'll make you better. I mean, typically the clubs that are on the shaft is a huge deal. People don't realize that. And typically the clubs that you're getting off the yeah. shelf are like stock, um, the shaft's going to be way too heavy or it doesn't have the right kick point. I mean, there's a whole bunch to it that they won't understand. That's why there's professionals that do this. They're like master fitters, kind of like master sommeliers, you know, of wine. I am definitely going to do that. Okay. Um, we have 18 minutes left and we have a bunch of questions. So um, let's ask a question about surgery. I'm going to put it all together. Number one, Generally, how long do the benefits of surgery last after successful non-invasive procedure in the lower back area? And then Dr. Fayez asked, how soon after non-invasive fusion do you let your patients play golf? Do you recommend at least a few weeks of focus PT before they start golfing? In addition to a regular PT, of course, no one wants a recurrence of problems slash symptoms or risk implant related issues. And then he also pointed out, Fred Couples' career took a significant hit from long-standing back pain, and Tiger Woods won the Masters last year after three back surgeries, and then finally a fusion surgery. So, number one, um, the recovery and the time that you can go back to sports varies from person to person and from procedure to procedure um, because the spine is kind of complicated. But if you have a, a, do a one- or two-level mental invasive fusion, you can get back to playing golf as early as six months, and tournament level playing uh, at a year, assuming six months is enough for you to train for a tournament. In the olden days, we used to make people wait a year. And we, when we used to do open surgery, um, because you basically disrupt the muscles that provide dynamic stability to the levels above and below the fusion uh, that you performed, you're at great risk for breaking down the adjacent level. And you don't have that dynamic stability, that the back brace that you were born with, the world's greatest back brace is non-functional after traditional midline open surgery. So once we started doing middle invasive surgery um, we, and preserving those muscles, and we also use much better implants, we also put them in much more precisely using computer navigation. If you're like me, you like utilizing all the latest and greatest like Formula One, um, you can get back to activities as soon as you feel like it. So if you're feeling well and you're an excellent golfer, you can start swinging at three months 
you may not want to play a tournament until 12 months to a year, but the constructs are really, really stable. Um, and the stronger the bones you have, uh, the earlier you can get back to activity. And, the, and for a professional, the longer you keep them off playing, the harder it is to get them back to prof professional level playing. So you want to basically tailor your recovery to the patient. But uh, waiting six months to a year, uh, providing all kinds of crazy restrictions on a patient um, does not make sense to me because they're a group of patients that can really rapidly uh, ramp up and they know their body and now they don't have you know, a floppy back because those muscles are working. You can get back to work really quickly. And then finally, how long does it last? It kind of depends. Unfortunately, in the spine, it's not like, you know, if you had five knee joints stacked on top of each other and you had a knee problem on your left knee, you could get knee problems in your left knee in four other places. Well, that's what the lumbar spine is like, is it has four to five motion segments, you know, each disc, and each one can have some kind of problem. Um, and oftentimes, it's not the level that you operate on, it's the level above and below that will either wear out just because it's going to wear out anyway, or because you did something at the level adjacent to it. So um, there's no set number, but what I noticed is that the number of times I have to do adjacent level problems after minimal invasive surgery is just like an order of magnitude less than when we used to do open surgery. By the same token, when you do minimal invasive surgery, there's probably a slightly higher chance that you need to operate at the same level because you didn't do enough surgery. But that is so much that that risk is so much smaller than the adjacent level problem. To me, it's a no-brainer um, to do everything minimal invasively. And the idea is simple. Go in and fix the problem without causing any as little collateral damage as possible because there's a reason why all these things are in your body. The muscles, the ligaments, the facet joints, all the blood vessels, all the little nerve endings, they have a function. And the best way to look at it is it's like the world's greatest back brace with like a million nanomachines all working to stabilize each motion segment. And the least you can, the most you can do to minimize the disruption of those tissues during surgery, the better long-term uh, in terms of kind of long-term durability. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my thoughts. On it. And then Reese? <laughs> what do you, you have know, to say? Watched injury, it's amazing what, how you do what you do, um, getting in there and, and solving the problem with, like you said, it's minimal amount of, of soft tissue trauma. It's just, it's amazing. And that our abdominal cavity is, uh, is all water, right? It's all organs and water. And so if we use that back brace you talked about, the transverse abdominis, if we have a good, strong transverse abdominis, it really presses our abdominal cavity up against the spine and supports it. So when you're using transverse abdominis, when you have good abdominal uh, cavity pressure, disc pressure goes down. If you're not using it and you're slack and you're, and you're in a flex position, then disc pressure goes up. So that goes right back to, okay, when they've had surgery, we start with working on transverse abdominis, multifidus, trying to get them to be in neutral and braced for just normal activities, getting up and out of bed, walking around, doing the normal stuff. And then after that, we work that into exercise, again, sports specific, and then back to sport. But you gotta have that foundation. You gotta get the muscles that, that control the spine, the erector spiny, um, and your obliques. You have to have all those working to compress this big ball in front and support your spine. Otherwise, this thing will fail and it fails pretty easily without that um, support. I mean, just take someone who's had abdominal surgery and they open the abdominal cavity and the pressure's gone. They feel like everything's gonna fall out and they just feel very unstable. Agreed. Bob, you had surgery like three? August, August 7th. So four months ago. Yeah, going on, going on four. November, October, November, oh. three months ago. A little over three months ago. What's your recovery been like? It was, I think, I was first amazed by when I walked right out, when I got off the operating table and I was able to walk and I, my left leg was perfect. I, I mean, that was the first and foremost. That was the greatest thing ever because I thought I was going to become be crippled. And I thought that was the greatest. But the other was a little bit slower on the right-hand side. And I think I, I may have tried a couple of uh, full swings with, with a wedge a little too soon. That was like three weeks ago and I had a little little relapse and I've been working hard with Reese, you know, and uh, we've 
come to the simple fact, remember, and then I think we, we were sent for facet joints because we thought mm -hmm. it might have been in the facets, but it still hurt. So then we've eliminated the facet joints and now yep. we're working on physical therapy. It seems to become a little bit better every day as day goes by. And actually yesterday, I, it's up to an eight iron. That's the first so time I've done that. That tells me that it's time. probably musculoskeletal, not joint related, not ligament related. That's good news. Um, so I think Bob has um, a very common problem in players in the 65, 70 age group and beyond. So they have Thanks. two problems. Thanks, doctor. First is that the discs are starting to wear out and you basically have arthritis um, like in your knee or your hip joint. But because the nerves run through that area, those bone spurs basically start taking up space. And just think about it, a nerve has to let generate electricity. So it needs lots of blood supply. And the way I think of about stenosis is it's like putting a tourniquet on your arm and then opening and closing your hand as fast as possible. After a while, it just will not work because there's just not enough blood flow. And the same thing happens to the nerves. Uh, and if it gets bad enough, you get numb and your foot starts getting floppy. It's called a drop foot. Or your quadriceps muscles get weak so that you step off a curb and your knee gives way. Mm -hmm. It's a very common cause of falls. Um, that's, a steno that's a stenosis operation. Um, to treat the arthritis, if it is arthritis, which I'm not sure that if that's your main cause of pain right now, um, that's why we do things like fusions. So that brings the level of surgery to a whole nother level of complexity. Um, so I try very, I try very much to avoid a fusion unless without a fusion, they're just not going to do well. And my mom had a two level fusion because that's what she needed. But I'm constantly thinking of ways to try to avoid a fusion, trying to treat people a little bit earlier, trying to use laser endoscopic techniques with a Band-Aid surgery to, um, to get patients uh, earlier, slightly earlier in the disease state so that they don't show up like at, in, at a time when they're just ready to give up their career and uh, they don't even care about golf anymore. So are, you, so are you saying that if you have pain caused by muscle tightness, which I know I've been in that position before, um, that it could lead to those things if it's not taken care of? No. Um, oh, so it's things. just totally two separate things. Yeah, okay. Muscle tightness, that when a muscle goes into a spasm, it's like having a calf cramp or a hamstring cramp. If you had those recently, you'll realize how unbelievably painful that is. That basically happens deep inside your back on top of the arthritis pain. That's the kind of pain that takes people's breaths away. They can't stand up straight. Um, mm -hmm. And is the kind of nagging pain that like, is deep inside there and you just feel like you just need to crack something and it'll like re like release but it won't um that's not something that needs surgery and that's good right. because if we have to do more surgery it'll probably be a fusion surgery um to treat the arthritis but uh that's why i was saying the uh, muscle problem although painful mm -hmm. is preferred because through exercise rehab you can almost always get rid of that it takes a while though so if anybody's I had a tennis elbow it takes like six months to a year for things like that to get better. It's so frustrating. Uh, I had a really bad case of golfer's elbow for over a year. I thought it would never go away, but now it's like, I think COVID helped that. I think it's hard to identify that too, because I remember walking into your office after I had my son, my, I had a huge baby and just carrying him around. So the weird, you know, carrying him over here, um, just killed my back to the point where if I sneezed, I was on the floor and I couldn't move and i feel like this happened a couple of weeks ago during if you're you're working out to stay healthy there's also a limit like it was it always happens on leg day if you take if you're doing too heavy of weight but it's kind of hard to identify right like if is this going to be a permanent thing do i need back surgery or do i give it a couple of days and hopefully just a lot of stretching fixes that that's yep, and the body has an unbelievable the, capacity to accommodate and heal. It's, it's shocking. So it's always worthwhile giving non-operative treatment a good try. In our, in our PT eval, I mean, it's a, it's a movement examination. We go step by step like, like a detective, try and figure out, is it a muscle problem? Is it a ligament problem? Is there disc pain? Is there radiating pain? Is there nerve problems? Is there neuro problems? Is weakness, reflexes? We go through all that and then figure out, Okay, this is more of a, of a mechanical problem. Bob, um, years and years ago, told me, and this is after we've been treating for a while, 
that his original pain was trying to help a guy lift a, a heavy hood off a classic car and he felt something mm -hmm. tear. He may have had an injury to soft tissue way back then that was still there. And then he developed the, the disc problem and the nerve problem. You fixed that, Dr. Kim. And now he's getting back to golf and he's still having some of the scar tissue problems. So we're, we're sequentially, like you said, get rid of the facet joints, that's not it. He's getting stronger. So it's not really a muscle thing. There's probably some scar tissue there. So we have to do that detective work. Otherwise, you don't know. You're like, well, it hurts. I don't want to do anything. And then you're stuck. Right. Oh, that's good. Okay. Next time that happens to me, I'm coming to you. You're down the street. So. <laughs> okay, we have a question about osteoporosis. Um, um, is osteoporosis a problem in golf? So from you know, my perspective, osteoporosis is a bone problem. So if you have severe osteoporosis and you bend down and pick up a ball or you hit the ground really hard, you could get something called a, a vertebral compression fracture. My dad had that. He was bending down to pick up a golf ball and he started having pain and he didn't finish the hole. And we're like, or the, the round, and we're like, we've never seen him do that. He ended up having a compression fracture. Uh, so that would be the reason, but um, I don't think golf is the problem. If you have osteoporosis, you should be working very hard to treat that through a, a weight-bearing exercise program and any medical treatment because when that gets out of control, a lot of weird things can happen. Uh, doesn't doesn't that affect your posture too, which would then in turn there. cause additional problems? Yep. No one knows why some people get like these asymptomatic buildup of wedge fractures so that they get what we call hypotic hump, um, but that could be one of them, that there are these tiny little micro fractures with maintaining certain weird postures. Um, so yes, if you have osteoporosis, you should probably be careful playing golf. You should probably be careful doing a lot of things and focus very hard on getting your osteoporosis better. All right, we have three minutes left. Does anybody have any burning questions? There's uh, another question, right? Oh, Dr. Okay. Dr. Fias is one of my favorite spine surgeons. Um, so he says, I have patients who want to do yoga, Pilates, et cetera, after back surgery. Thoughts? What do you guys think? It's kind of um, stretching. Aren't those good things? Yoga is one of those things that it's, it's such a broad spectrum of, of movements that I always advise patients to go into that very carefully because if you get yourself in a, war a warrior pose where you're flexing and rotating and, and extending all at the same time, that can be way too much for the, the, mm -hmm. for the injured or post-op spine. Pilates generally is more neutral centered, but yoga, you have to be caref careful about the repeated movements and the combined movements. Um, but it, is, it is good to stretch and it is a good system of stretching and meditation and all that and strengthening too, but you have to go at it very slowly and carefully doing a, a back-centered yoga class, not, not just the hot yoga. Yep, I, I, um, I get asked this question a lot and I have a very kind of unsatisfying answer to most people, which is it's different for everybody. You should customize it and uh, yoga could be great for you, but it could also hurt you. Like anything, if you just started any exercise without forethought, without gradually easing into it and without having some degree of confidence that you're capable of doing that exercise without injuring yourself, it could be, you know, underwater basket weaving, you could injure yourself. So I don't care about yoga, Pilates and things like that. I care more that whatever you do decide to undertake, you do it in a gradual way. You have some mechanism by which you can monitor yourself either have, a, I always recommend either getting a coach or a workout buddy or two workout buddies and you coach each other. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's yoga or Pilates, it's more important that you find an exercise regimen that you enjoy doing and that is not just the exercise, it's the environment, it's the whole kind of vibe of that exercise. You want to say, I'm a Pilates person or I'm a yoga person. That whole thing needs to happen to make this a long lasting kind of health, fitness, uh, lifestyle. Because just doing it for six weeks, six months, and then stopping is not the solution. You have to find an exercise regimen where you exercise almost every single day in my mind. Every single day would be my answer. Uh, so Reese, correct me if matter. I'm wrong, but wouldn't the focus be on the core? Like, is that something that we want to yeah. be working on to help stabilize, right? I know you were talking about that earlier. There were a lot of big words and I'm just thinking abs. Core being, 
your glutes, you know, the, the right diesel, left diesel, the glutes are really important. The stronger your glutes, the, the less stress on your spine. And, it, and as guys age, they tend to lose their butt, they lose their glutes, and then they end up with back pain. So that's a pretty, pretty easy one to see. So your core is your, is your, your hips, your glutes, your abdominals, and your low back muscles. And Pilates does address that kind of thing, but you, you wanna be focused on having good, strong core. And that's why I teach every patient gets the same spiel, neutral spine, abdominal brace. And then we build on that with other exercises that are yoga or Pilates like, or in the gym using bands or using <laughs> Bob's favorite, the body blade. Oh yeah, so there it is. There it is, Bob, really working oh. the body blade. That is- I'm starting to get shivers yeah. already. <laughs> <laughs> things to keep you going. All right, so Bob, what is your exercise regimen? Like, what is it like uh, typical in the zero minutes that we have left? Right now, I'm, I'm walking every day. I'm walking further now than I ever have. The only trouble with walking you, is you got to come back. Right. So if I could, somebody pick me up down there, it'd be okay. But anyway, you no, know, uh, that plus I got nine exercises that the release has given me. Nine of them, they're standard ones, I guess, that risk them, and I haven't stopped doing them at all. And today was the first day I finally found somebody that I can go back and move some metal. Finally found them, they have a, right here in San Marcos, have a gym, it's actually open. Yeah. And uh, and I went in there today and I wound up a personal trainer. Yes, shouldn't say that. But anyway, personal trainer, and uh, he worked with me. Good. And, uh, First time I've moved metal in about six months. Good. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. All right. It's 5.01. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, thank you to Bob and Reese and Kendra. Um, and just as a departing kind of thought, I think um, I'd like to kind of share with you my thoughts that life is really short and, and it doesn't have to be golf. But if there's something that brings joy in your life and you want to keep pursuing it, um, you know, there's not a quick fix for this. It's, it's a lifestyle change that will affect not just your golf, for example, but everything else. But it's important to kind of slowly ease into a, a different lifestyle that's focused on health, health well-being, um, consistency, um, et cetera. Um, because a lot of people think surgery is going to just be a quick fix. And... If you have spine surgery, you still have to do all those things anyway that I just told you about after surgery to make that surgery last. So uh, there's really no reason to wait to start this kind of non-operative health and wellness program, even though you think you might be needing surgery because you're going to need to do that even after surgery anyway. So with that, thank you all for joining us. I hope that was helpful. Please um, uh, keep an eye peeled for an Bob. email and give mm -hmm. us a some thoughts on future webinars. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you. Take care.